I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spin Up ahead the road is been Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. When you travel, you're likely to meet other travelers. Come meet Moses Walters. In the time Up and down time Cow Creek is where we found Moses Walters doing his traveling. He started in 1926. Moses Walters delivers the mail. As for the voyageurs, the greatest of all the traveling men of another time in this country, not much is left but the river they paddled and the portage they made. But their spirits still seem to rendezvous up in Minnesota, just as they did every year centuries ago. Here are the most beautiful travelers you'll ever meet. How do they know where to come back to? It's a miracle. It is a miracle. Once upon a time, however, we all did our traveling on horseback, which is to say that once upon a time, there may have been lots of men like Ben K. Green. Ben K. Green is an uncommon man. He is a doctor, a philosopher, an author, and a trader. And what he doctors, philosophizes on, writes about, and trades are horses. From the time he rode away from his family ranch at the age of 13 until the present moment, Ben K. Green has spent his whole life in corrals and livery stables and wagon yards, cheating and being cheated, measuring, judging, buying, selling, cursing, currying, and talking horses. Where did uh, that little black horse come from? That's a stray. I don't know who she is or where she came from. She showed up here in the pasture a few days ago. She seems and, to be eating your oats, all right. Yeah, and somebody will come along in a few days that's missed her. Or they may have already missed her and realized the grass is good in this pasture, and it'll be a few days finding her, you know, <laughs> either one. Well, if you, if you were trying to sell me that horse, what would you uh, find good to say about her? Well, I'd say she's a four-year-old and about 14 hands high and would be ideal for a small rider or a kid. And she's a nice little short blocky mare with small feet and a uh, pretty good pony, you know, something you'd be proud of. And uh, about how much would you ask for a horse like oh, that? Oh, I'd ask a hundred and a half for her. I think she's worth $90, but I'd be trying you, you know. <laughs> I doubt if she's got much breeding, but I wouldn't tell you that. Now, suppose, on the other hand, you were trying to buy that little horse. Well, I'd say I, I wouldn't be trying to buy her, but if I were, I'd say she's long back and short-shouldered, and that her eye didn't set out on the side of her head good enough, and that she probably didn't have good enough feet to carry her weight, and uh, she had a short hind quarter, and would just, I'd think she's a rather common kind of a horse that would be worth about $60. <laughs> now, would you rather I'd buy her from you or sell her to you? <laughs> huh? In your uh, long career as a horse trader, did you ever get cheated? Oh, a million times. You get cheated all the time. And it sharpens you up, it's good for you. And while you're getting cheated, you're liable to learn a trick that you can use for maybe more than it costs you, too, you know. But the man had never been cheated trading horses, didn't trade but once, you know. <laughs> uh, and that, that adds this to the deal. You're always, a, uh, you never admit you're cheated. And if an old timer cheats you or anybody cheats you, you give him, it gives you a certain amount of respect for him. And uh, you don't get mad at him or raise any trouble about how he cheated you. You file it for future use. How rough was it for a horse trader in the, in the early days? You had your problems, but it was all fun. It was all fun. And I stayed at it when kids my age were 
getting them a flivver and stripping it down. And once in a while, a rich kid might get a motorcycle, you know. But the old men at the wagon yards and the liver stables had what I wanted. And uh, I was referred to as being backward because I kept some good shod horses and traded horses and stayed at the liver stable in the wagon yard when the other kids were up on Knob Hill, you know. No regrets. No about... regrets. I wouldn't change a day of it. Ben K. Green wrote the book on horse trading. It is called Horse Trading, and you can read it, but you still won't be a horse trader. It takes a lifetime for that. And since life in the West today is all tractors and combines and pickup trucks, take a good look at Ben K. Green. He's likely the last of his breed you'll be meeting. While the billows journey roll, while the tempest is high. Here on Cow Creek in McGoffin County, the postman doesn't ring twice. He doesn't even ring once, but nobody doubts when he's coming. That's Moses Walters carrying the United States mail. Moses Walters rides a mule because a mule is the only conveyance that can be counted on to carry the mail and the mailman all the way to the end of Cow Creek. He sings because he just feels like singing. He's been riding a mule and singing six days a week since 1926. And the United States Post Office Department, which mostly rides around in red, white, and blue trucks, has long ago accustomed itself to the fact that on days when trucks are stuck in snowdrifts, the mail gets through on Cow Creek. Moses Walters' day starts early at the post office in Hager, Kentucky, where he ties his mailbags on his mule, Julie. He has had several mules, and they've all been named Julie. Moses Walters is a man of inflexible routine, and the fewer changes in his life, the better he likes it. We would tell you how old he is, but he wouldn't tell us. He is old enough, he says, to keep his nose out of other people's business. At 10 minutes after 11 a.m., he arrives at the post office in Stella, Kentucky, and carefully ties Julie to the same fence post. At Stella, he drops off some mail and picks up some more, part of it in cloth bags or pokes. How do you tell the pokes apart? Just by the looks of them. Them and hang them on in order. So mm -hmm. they, uh, they should brand them, uh, have their initials on them. I, uh, I believe that would be the requirement that it uh, would be required, I would think. Who's this They're hard to. Now, this is a reed poke out here, and this is with Adams. And uh, uh, this is one of the Burton, it's Burton poke. This is um, also poke. Moses Walters would pause that long to talk, no longer. He carries more than pokes and packages. He carries a sense of mission. And he's not quite the anachronism you might think. We talked about that to Paul Smith, the rural delivery analyst of the regional post office. At one time, all of our routes were muleback or horseback routes. And as the roads improved and vehicle equipment became better, we took them out and put vehicles in, but still, there are some remote areas that we cannot serve the people with vehicles on a year-round basis, so we have to resort to mules. We believe the time is coming for the Lord to come again. I believe the end is nearing every door. The folks along Cow Creek wondered what in the world we wanted to take pictures of Moses for. For more than 40 years, they have seen him every day and heard the same hymns echoing behind him after he has passed. He is ordinary to them, so they have not stopped to consider that it takes a lot of people to make a country work and that one of them might be an old man on a mule. Let us meet him with a shout For he tells us in his word to watch and pray This is the time of year the monarch butterflies migrate north from Pacific Grove, where a couple million of them have spent the winter, and raise with their departure all kinds of troubling questions for man who outweighs them but can't outsmart them. 
In the first place, monarchs are confused by radio, television, and radar waves and destroyed by atomic fallout, fertilizer, insect sprays, air pollution, and the construction of housing projects on their breeding grounds. So how do they survive at all? In the second place, when they leave here, they fly as far as 2,000 miles into Canada through storms and across mountains and deserts, sometimes even across oceans, though they are as fragile as feathers. How do they do it? In the third place, these butterflies do not live long enough to return to Pacific Grove, but next fall, their Canadian-born offspring will come to the very same trees their parents are now leaving. By what miracle of navigation do butterflies who've never been here find their way each year? Good questions to ponder next time you start feeling like the master of all you survey. I put some of the questions to one of Pacific Grove's more ardent butterfly admirers, Mrs. Shirley Bass. What uh, is the uh, basis of the affection between Pacific Grove and butterflies? Well, it dates back uh, to Indian times. In Indian folklore, there was this lovely chant that the Indian children reputedly said every fall when they saw them, the great golden horde of butterflies. They said, they have come, they have come, bringing peace and bringing plenty. And we still think they're a sign of very good luck and good fortune. Besides that, they're nice to watch. They're lovely. They're fragile and they're beautiful. It's a, a, a dire offense to harm one. $500 and six months in jail. This is a city that loves fragile, beautiful creatures, and we protect them by law, by ordinance. How do they know where to come back to? It's a miracle. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But it sort of uh, gives you faith that things are going to uh, go on and on. There's some sort of uh, continuity that we can't understand, and yet it's delightful to contemplate. To the credit of Pacific Grove, it knows that it's got some kind of miracle on its hands here, and as small towns will, it celebrates its miracle on private walls and public streets. We found here a bulky statue to the monarchs, and so help us, a wreath bidding them farewell. We even found a little girl, Lisa Henderson by name, caught up in the spirit of the season, seeking not to molest butterflies, but only to meet one. She never really did, but she shouldn't feel too badly about that. The monarchs don't reveal themselves to grown men with doctorates in biology either. They are bright, diaphanous mysteries, very hard to get to know. I'll tell you, I like molasses, good old country sorghum, and thereby hangs a tune. I like molasses, good old country sorghum, and I eat them in the summer in the fall. When they trickle down my chin, I just lick them off again. That's the way I like them best of all. At Gold Rush Junction in the Smokies, Jim Ball sings a song of sorghum for the tourists. It is the anthem of the season. For all through these mountains, they're cutting the sorghum cane for a sweet purpose. I like molasses, good old country sorghum, eat them in the summer and the fall. When they get so full of flies, they look like a raisin bar, that's the way I like them best of all. Down on Webb's Creek in Pittman Center, Tennessee, we found Bud Allen's mule pacing round and round the ancient cane mill, Joseph Ramsey feeding the grinder, and the sweet juice of autumn rapidly filling a wash tub. I like molasses, good old country sorghum, I eat them every morning and night. When they get between my toes, they're fine enough I know that's the way I like them best of all. And there, standing in the steam of the evaporator, there with half the community, including his own wife, offering advice, there we met the master sorghum maker of this hollow, Clon Owenby. They have, they've got sulfur and iron in them. They're good for you if you, uh, if you can eat them without them bothering your stomach. Well, now, you just, you just don't eat them plain. No, I wouldn't recommend that at all. How do you do it? <laughs> well, the best way to do it is to get you some good, white, puffy butter. Good cow butter. White puffy cow butter and mix your molasses with the butter and stir it all up good in your plate and you've got a really good... Eat them with good... hot biscuits. Eat them with hot biscuits. 
You see those fond blubbers in there now? Yeah. As long as those fond blubbers are in there, there's still water. It's, there's too much water in it. They won't keep. So you got to get rid of those bubbles. You got to get rid of those bubbles. And this is the finished product. That's the finished product. Well, that's thick. <laughs> that's thick. <laughs> Mr. Wayne, kill the fire and we can get these off. And so the thing is done. Molasses is a plural noun, as you may have noticed, and everybody who loves them sorghums observes now as they are strained into a can to cool, and the next batch is started through the steam. This is the great moment of the Tennessee fall, which makes tolerable the thought of the winter ahead. I like molasses, good old country sorghums. I eat them in the summer and the fall. When they twinkle down my chin, I just lick them off again. That's the way I like them best of all. This is a voice from Minnesota's past, the words of a voyageur, which somebody wrote down in 1750. I am a voyageur. I could carry, paddle, walk, and sing with any man I ever saw. I have been 24 years a canoe man and 41 years in service. No portage was ever too long for me. I spent all my money in pleasure. Were I young again, I should spend my life the same way over. This is the Pigeon River. That's Minnesota, that's Canada. This is a lonely, quiet stream now, sleeping in the late summer sun. But the pigeon has her memories. Once, this river was the superhighway of half a continent. In the first half of the 18th century, when Minnesota was mostly uncharted wilderness, this one river was well known. It was the route of the voyageurs, the legendary canoe men of the French fur trade, whose flashing paddles brought them every year 2,000 miles from the wilds of Athabasca, their canoes filled with beaver furs, to meet the traders who had paddled west from Montreal at a summer rendezvous. The Pigeon River lay at the end of their journey. But just at the end, the pigeon betrayed them. A series of high waterfalls blocked the way to Lake Superior. So the last nine miles to their destination was on foot, the great portage, Le Grand Portage. The footpath is still here and still a footpath. We found Dr. Donald Ennis and his son Dave making the portage along the narrow trail where hundreds of tons of otter and beaver were once packed out on the way to becoming hats and capes for the fashionable ladies and gentlemen of Europe. The trail ended here, a stockaded fort beside an Indian village on the western shore of Lake Superior, an 18th century middle of nowhere. To the voyageurs, it was the center of the world. Here, for a few days each summer, the trappers from the North Country, the mappers of empire and traders from the East, and the Chippewa, with whom they traded, met for hard bargaining, hard dancing, and hard drinking. It was a market and it was a party, the payoff for an expensive gamble on the bounty of interior North America, the release that made bearable the wilderness winter just past and the wilderness winter to come. In the course of history, the French flag was replaced by the British and the British by the Americans. No matter, the rendezvous and all it represented went on. All that for this, the pelt of the beaver, 200 tons of these furs left Minnesota in 1660. That was just the first shipment of a trade that went on for 150 years. It was disastrous for the beaver who were decimated. It was disastrous for the Chippewa who traded their way of life for a gun and an ax. And now, of course, it is all past. A replica of a voyageur canoe is left for Chippewa children to play in. Two medals are left worn by Chief John Flatt as they have been worn by Chippewa chiefs for 200 years. Two pieces of silver from King George III. The voyageurs who boasted that they could carry, paddle, walk, and sing with any man are gone, and Grand Portage's song is over. But this place, the Pigeon River, the Falls, the Portage, and the Indian Village on the lake shore, are the proudest part of Minnesota's past, the focal point of an adventure that mapped the North American continent to the Arctic and the Pacific and opened the northern frontier of a new nation. 
Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around the bend